uh, some context of designing sliding mode observers. And the first thing we have to do is very much to think about the work we did yesterday and have a deep knowledge and understanding of, of sliding mode control because sliding mode observers have some very fundamental differences. So the problems are not a line. We know that if we think in terms of linear control theory, for example, we can design a state feedback controller, as we did yesterday, based on some nominal AB state space system. And we know that if we take the equivalent A transpose C transpose system, we can design a, an observer using exactly the same theoretical approach. So in terms of linear control theory, the state feedback control problem, the observer problem are highly aligned. It is not the case in sliding mode observers that the problem is a true dual of the sliding mode control problem. And it's really, really important to understand not only some of the fundamental differences in terms of the paradigm, but also to understand um, what we can and can't do in terms of the design. I'm going to take a historical perspective and I'm going to motivate sliding mode observers by looking at the very first one that appeared in the literature which I've called the Utkin Observer, largely because it appeared in Professor Utkin's book. And we will look at some of the positives and negatives of that by a tutorial example. I'm going to say a little bit about historical milestones. So um, from that uh, uh, place, how we got to where we are today. And I'm going to give a little bit of information on some, some key steps. Sometimes in, in the, the evolution of a technology, we have key points, key pieces of knowledge, which enable us to make big progress. So disruptive thinking that makes a paradigm change. And one of those pieces of disruptive thinking in terms of sliding mode observers was um, a piece of work by um, uh, Walcott and Zach, who really changed the paradigm. So they, they made a step change from where we'd been with the Utkin Observer, which allowed us to get into the ways of thinking about observer design that we use today. So that was a very transformative step. Um, and from that, I'm going to introduce a construct constructive framework which will depend on a canonical form which we can then take into our session this afternoon well not this afternoon today we can take into our next session after our tea break which will allow us to do some work with MATLAB and design observers and test them um, rather like we did yesterday so it will be a mirror of the session we did yesterday afternoon but the focus will be on getting all the delegates up to speed with feeling confident about designing sliding mode observers. Now it has to be said, rather like I told you yesterday, that sliding mode control came out of the work in the Soviet Union. And at that point, there was nothing about observers. So sliding mode control as a switched control strategy was very much focusing on a control paradigm. There was no observer paradigm obser uh, evolving at, the set, uh, at that time. We know what the control does. We have a switching function. We take some measure of behavior and we decide what particular um, what particular controller we should use. The important thing, the important step, if you like, uh, 
uh, of a subclass of these variable structure controllers is the sliding mode paradigm. And what we know about that control paradigm and what we spent, you know, all of yesterday doing was trying to cause things, we were driving things to zero. So whether it would be an aerodynamics, whether it would be a, 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 a simpler switching function relating um, to, to asymptotic stabilization, we saw that sliding mode controllers were incredibly good at driving S to zero. So that immediately tells us that there might be something for the observer problem there. Because in an observer, we effectively have a dynamics, which we're using as a model of the system. We're looking at that model. We're looking at the real system. And we're trying to zero the error between those two systems. So this, this notion of being able to drive something to zero is highly important. And so it looks as if this could be useful. Now, having said that there is the potential for it to be useful, we have to think of the advantages and disadvantages of the control problem from yesterday to see how they might translate into an observer problem. Well, one of the first things we saw when we started our lecture yesterday was we could take a system which had no phases of behavior which were asymptotically stable, and we could stabilize it. What is more, we could stabilize it in a way that prescribed the dynamics entirely by the choice of switching function. So this ability to specify dynamics was seen as highly important. The robustness was also seen as important. We saw that we could apply um, disturbance signals. We could look at the impact of uncertainty. And we saw that for some classes, there was a very strong robustness. In fact, it was a total invariance. Refer you back to the double integrator when compared to the scaled pendulum, where we have an uncertainty fundamentally a sinusoid. The dynamics were completely the same in both cases after some initial transient robustness. And those things are clearly going to translate quite well into an observer paradigm. The first is, is becomes trivial. You know, there isn't a, a, a need to prescribe highly fancy dynamics to an observer problem. Zeroing that error between the, what the plant is doing and what the observer is doing is the design requirement for an observer. That's, that, that's it. So we want to do that, and we want to do that as quickly as possible. So very much more like the reachability problem from yesterday. The robustness is clearly good because we know that for any model we care to make of a plant, as we said yesterday, whether it's a control problem, whether it's an observer problem, there is the model we use to develop that controller or observer is not going to be an exact match of the real plant. So robustness is always an issue. What about the disadvantages? Well, we, you know, as scientists, we must always be open about the positives and the negatives of, of, of what we do. And as I said, yesterday that we had this discontinuous injection, which could be fine for paraelectronics, but the, the, the discontinuous injection that is required in theory to achieve this total invariance could be a problem in practice when it comes to um, looking um, at real mechanical systems, for example, that may very well not like um, to be and would, uh, you know, 
undergo fatigue and stress and wear from having this constant uh, uh, switching. Now, we can see straight away, and as I hinted yesterday, that that is not going to be such a problem. It's not going to be such a problem at all. But there are deeper things we need to look at. The first thing is we have to recognize that the development of sliding mode observers is much less mature in the sense that if you look at the period of time over which observers have been being developed is much shorter. So the, uh, from the roots of the fundamental work in the former Soviet Union, it was all about control. Observers came much later. But it's also important to note that when you look at the real applications and the number of people outside of a sliding mode control community uh, of researchers using these methods and using them seriously in industry, it might be less mature, but boy, is it being found to have great application. So it is being used... Um, uh, uh, in some very exciting ways in industry, as I will show you um, uh, uh, a little bit later on in, in one of the other lectures. And it's very different. So the things we get at, we, we get, are that it's good at zeroing something. If we think of what we know from that dynamical system which is the plant and the model of the dynamical system which we're going to develop our observer um, based on, what we actually know is the output. If we knew the state, we wouldn't need an observer in most cases. There wouldn't be a purpose of having uh, an observer, although we will see an example later where... The, you know, industry has some measurements, so it isn't that it can't measure, but it wants to monitor parameters. And so in that case, we can design an observer based on um, um, knowledge of, of the state, so we're not seeking to estimate the state. But in general, we can't assume for an observer that we know all about the state. So the thing we're going to slide on is going to be the output error the Y in the state space system. So we're going to be able to measure the output Y from the plant, the output Y hat from the observer, and form an error. And from what we saw yesterday, I think you can clearly see that that error can be zeroed. And it will be identically zeroed. It'll just be like the S when we did the MATLAB problems yesterday and we saw going straight down to zero very, very quickly, staying zero to some very, very small tolerance, even in the presence of uncertainty, nonlinearity, as we had a nonlinear model there. And that's fundamentally different to what a Leuenberger observer does, and indeed almost any other observer you care to, care to name. If you think about it, most observers take a measure of Y, and Y hat as the difference, just as we are doing, but they can't zero it. They make it small. They end up with a set of states, X minus X hat, where nominally X, um, uh, uh, the error between X and X hat goes to zero asymptotically. That's what a Leuenberger observer does. So this is fundamentally different to what a sliding mode observer does. Y minus Y hat goes to zero in finite time and it goes to zero exactly. And it goes to zero despite uncertainty, etc., just as we saw in the control problem. So what you get from a sliding mode observer is a set of states that are, are, are aligned and commensurate with the current output. So you have a model which has exactly the same output as the plant. And that's different. 
almost any other observer you take, other than in nominal situations where there's no uncertainty, where there's no disturbances, y minus y hat won't be zero, and you'll get a set of states, x minus x hat, which are all approximations of the other. The sliding mode observer has the sub-portion of the states that are aligned to the output exactly right. So the error is zero. And then it has another subset of the states that are commensurate with that output, um, um, but which won't necessarily be zero, and indeed won't necessarily be the states of the actual plant. But they will be a set of states whereby your observer gives you the same output. So that's important to recognize. The second thing that we saw yesterday was that we, um, we could analyze the control signal. And we applied the sinusoid to the pendulum. We looked at what the smooth control law was doing. And we saw, effectively, the sinusoid come through. So the injection signal we applied, which was a control signal, was telling us all about the uncertainty and the disturbance. The same thing happens with the observer. So the observer injection we're going to use is going to be discontinuous. And the mismatch that we, any mismatch between what the plant is doing and what the observer is doing will come through on that signal. So that's a hugely important uh, thing when it comes to monitoring of systems. So if you design on day one a model that reasonably approximates your plant, um, and you set it up as an observer of that plant, and you see something change in that average injection signal over time, you know that something is going wrong with that plant. So very, very important property for condition monitoring. And for me, what was fabulous when um, sliding mode observers, we, we started to really work at them in, 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 uh, seriously, Chris Edwards and, uh, and myself, um, was that all the issues about discontinuity, not a problem. It just sits on a microprocessor. It's a model. We can switch as much as we like. No problem at all. Indeed, high gain is not a problem. Um, we um, yesterday talked about um, putting linear parts in uh, the control to keep the control signal down. Sometime I, uh, sometimes I will do that with an observer just to, to, to help the design because if we have too high a gain, we can have numerical problems. But, you know, it is a much more straightforward problem. There is no physical limit like there is on an actuator where with a control signal we cannot apply more than the, rate, than the rate limit or the position limit on the particular actuator. Within the observer problem, we don't have those limits. Um, so we have signals that can switch where we have much more um, ability to use gain to our advantage, and so we can do better des designs. And much of the limitations from the sliding mode control perspective, go away. They are not relevant for sliding mode observers. So let's take a similar system to the one we had yesterday, x number of states, uh, u number of outputs. The difference, because we're dealing with an observer, is we've now got an output equation. And I'm assuming that p here is the number of outputs. And I'm going to assume I've got more outputs than I've um, got inputs, if I'm, uh, or at least as many outputs as I've got uh, uh, inputs. Um, rather like yesterday, I'm assuming B and C have full rank. So I'm assuming that every, single, every signal I've got in terms of an input measurement or an output measurement is linearly independent 
because if I've got dependent channels, I can just put, push them together and reduce the number of channels. Um, and at this stage, I'm assuming AC is observable. We'll see why AC is observable was assumed um, in Professor Utkin's early designs and was one of the reasons why we stepped away from that framework. We will end up with a framework which doesn't require AC to be observable. So we will have conditions which don't uh, amount to that. And as I said uh, yesterday, there are good examples in, uh, in the literature where um, systems which are not observable uh, are actually, uh, for which we design sliding mode uh, uh, observable uh, observers. Again yesterday we said that coordinate changes were important, canonical forms were important. And they're going to be just as important for sliding mode observers. The change of coordinates that we will use embedded in everything we build up today will relate here to this equation. So this will somewhere be in it, which fundamentally makes the last P set of the states in the observer the output the output we're going to be working on the output error. And so for the error dynamics this time, we will have an N minus P system, which contains, if you like, the, the errors corresponding to the rest of the system. And then the bottom P states will be the output error. So they will be correspond to the Y minus Y hat. So, and this is just to make the design easier. Um, to make it uh, intuitively more straightforward. So we transform to make sure that the Y dynamics, the output dynamics, appears in the bottom here. And as you can see, the input can be anywhere. doesn't matter. The input is known for an observer. Typically, for any observer, we assume we know the input and output of the system. And this is the same for our observers. So this is a known signal. Y <coughs> is known, X1 is not known. Now, what Professor Utkin did was he took this model of the plant, and fundamentally that's at the heart of any observer design. We take a model, so you can see this really here, is copied directly, so three and four, appear exactly in 5 and 6. The only difference is the states in 3 and 4 of the plant are replaced by the states of the observer. So I'm using a hatted states for the observer states here. And then he added in some injection terms to force the um, observer error to 0. L here is some sort of gain matrix. And the new I are just a simple switch here. So it's, the, it's some gain times the sign of the output error. So what happens if we look at what this system gives us? Well, with any observer, we have to look at the error dynamics. So here I've written down for the two subsystems x1 hat minus x1 to give me e1, which becomes the first error subsystem, and the output error ey, which is the y hat minus y, which I'm going to force to zero. So for this system, this is what the error dynamics look like. The impact of the input has gone away because we know the signal. So when we take the difference, those terms go. What um, Professor Utkin did was he said that since we had an AC pair which was observable, remember it was in my original uh, 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 assumption, this corresponding pair here, A11, A21, is also observable. So that was very much like yesterday, and it's very similar. You can apply the rank test in just the same way um, to the AB controllable problem 
to show that the A11, A12 is, is controllable. You can do the same thing to the observability, uh, to test observability, and you can look at the rank condition for AC to be observable, and some simple um, algebra then shows that A11, A21 is also observable. And this means that we can choose an L to make A11 plus L A21 stable. Now, if you think about it, if that is stable and we can drive EY to zero, this, this is fine. EY, we, can, we know we can drive to zero. We know what it is. We've got EY dot here. We've got a new here which depends on EY. So if you think of our reachability condition, if we have a new here that is um, uh, uh, a function of the, uh, the sign of the output error, then that is sufficient to mean that the output error and its derivative have opposite sign, because this is the derivative, this is negative. So the output error here, for sufficiently large m, that will mean that EY goes to zero. EY goes to zero, this goes. We've put something in via this that makes this subsystem stable. The observer um, converges uh, to, to zero. To see this, um, what um, Professor Rutkin did in his book was define a change of coordinates looking like this. Effectively, it's like we did with the M yesterday. Do you remember when we put the M in there to solve the reachability problem and we had that second transformation? Here we're pulling the EY, some of the EY signal up into the E1 dynamics in order to stabilize the system. So if we do that, we have an aerodynamic system looking like this where this A11 tilde here is stable by the choice of L. We um, have these other matrices. They don't, these A12 tilde and A22 tilde don't really matter because here we know that via nu we can choose it to mean that EY and EY dot have uh, opposite signs. So this can be made bigger than anything that's going on here. And we don't have to worry about size, as we said, because we're designing an observer problem. So we have much more freedom about size. We're not, we don't have physical limits there. So this will make EY go to zero. This, once EY has gone to zero, then this will go to zero asymptotically because of this. So you can show formally that this reachability condition, the inter-reachability condition, just as we looked at today, is satisfied. And because of that, we know that a sliding mode will take place on that surface. After some time, the output error will be zero, um, and its derivative will be zero. And the dynamics in the sliding mode are determined by the choice of L, rather like the choice of M yesterday for the control problem. It's stable, and consequently, um, the output, uh, uh, sorry, the um, error between x1 and x1 hat will go to zero. So we can see this happen. We can take a very simple A, B, C here. It's actually a, a simple harmonic oscillator. I'm not considering a U because, as we saw, we can take it in and, and, and put it, uh, uh, we can add it in and take it away. So for the observer design, the U is not, not so not so critical. I've done an oscillator because clearly to show good observer performance, we don't want a system where everything's gone to zero. Again, when you're writing your papers, I'm sure you wouldn't do that, but it's surprising to see many people who choose to observe asymptotically stable systems. So they effectively show their observer error goes to zero, but they're observing a plant where the state has gone to zero. So that is not such a difficult thing to do. It's much more difficult for an observer to observe an unstable system, for example. So, so bear that in mind if you're considering developing work in observers um, to, to show um, 
wider dynamics like chaotic systems or unstable systems is much more powerful than to observe a stable system and show everything goes to zero. Okay, we define the matrix here. This is the output equation, so that's the first transformation. So very simply there, the output equation. It gives me my change of coordinates here. So we can see that we've changed <coughs> so that um, the um, second state in the transformed coordinates is just the output of the system. I've chosen an observer gain of 0 0.5, which gives me an error, um, uh, uh, the error in the x1 minus x1 hat subsystem um, to be governed by a system which has a pole at minus 2.5. And I set M equal to uh, 1. And you can see very nicely what, what happens. This here is the output error. Okay, so that's the error between Y minus Y hat. Goes to 0, exhibits a sliding mode. You might say, well, it doesn't go straight to 0, but we've got to bear in mind that in this suite of problems today, we have less information. Yesterday, we had full state information. So with full state information, driving something to zero directly can be done. Given that we only have the output measurement, we don't have as much freedom in terms of what we can do to the dynamics. And so in an observer problem, you may well see an initial transient. Okay, which will be dynamics that we can't directly affect by the output signal that we have got. And once that sliding mode is exhibited here, we can see that the transient on the x1 minus x1 hat dynamics exhibits that pole at minus, um, what did I say the pole was that I, minus 2.5. So we can see something here which is decaying with something which looks like minus 2.5. So the dynamics we've chosen for that upper, upper subsystems, we can see that it decays asymptotically to zero. Okay? If we look what's going on in the state, we can see that that hasn't occurred because all the states have gone to zero. We've got an oscillator here where the system is oscillating and you can see the tracking errors go to zero. The dotted lines are the true states. The solid lines are the observer states. And you can see we had different initial conditions. Um, the observer converges quite nicely where here the output error converges first, and then this converges with its asymptotic decay. And you've got to bear in mind that typically for an observer problem, a transient will be a startup phenomena. You know, if an observer is being used to estimate something or for condition monitoring, it'll be running for a very long time. Again, it's on a it's on a PC. You know, it's not a plant that suddenly shot up and done something extraordinary in the startup. So ha the startup is much less important for an observer because it's happening in software. In terms of the relative time that the observer is operating and what it's seeking to do, um, it's a very small amount of time in terms of doing, um, doing, it, doing its job. Here's new, and you can see I'm not worried at all. It was switching, um, taking place um, once we'd hit that sliding mode. Um, you could sit, you know, after that time, and we can see it continuing to switch. No problem in terms of the outputs we've seen. So that just used discontinuity. So it was just using a discontinuous injection. The next step, oh, press the wrong thing. The next stage 
was to consider putting in some sort of linear injection, rather like we did yesterday. Yesterday, we needed that observability um, criteria. Um, sorry, yesterday we needed the controllability criteria. For what we've just done, we needed observability criteria, and we need the discontinuous injection to stabilize that first subsystem. So if we begin to think about using some linear gains, rather like we used the linear controller yesterday, and using the discontinuous injection only in the second subsystem, this can have benefits. So we're not using the discontinuous injection anymore to stabilize that first subsystem aerodynamics. And fundamentally what we do here is we are choosing G1 here and G2 to make sure that we stabilize the system here via gain and we choose something to give asymptotic reaching just as we did yesterday. So A22S is something that we pick to help tailor the um, evolution of those aerodynamics. And then we're purely lose using the discontinuous injection to, um, to provide reachability on that output error. And it's stable because the combined poles of this here and this here are zero. So it's asymptotically stable anyway. Um, this is finite time stable because we have the discontinuity on the output error. And this is a step forward. So no longer do we need the switching action to make the error system stable. We still need the pair AC to be observable because we're designing those two get sets of gain matrices to stabilize that A11 and A22, the diagonal subsystems. Um, but it's better, a step forward, it's closer to what we did yesterday, and it's better really not to have the switching action to make, um, to provide st stability. Um, from these kind of very simple uh, 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 ideas, there were various um, developments. Um, the first was what's called the Slotine Observer. And that was very much, if you remember, I showed you the, the classical um, observability, controllability type canonical forms yesterday, and I showed you that they naturally lent themselves to sliding mode controller design. And I said to you that it was possible to do this for nonlinear systems in these forms in a very similar way. Slotin did that for the observer systems. So he took output uh, 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 errors. Um, he used the same kind of linear and discontinuous feedback as we've just seen for the Utkin observer, but he did it for nonlinear systems in comp companion form. And what he defined was the notion of the, of the sliding patch. Now, what did, that, what did that actually mean? When we looked at this, I said to you, there isn't much we can do about this. You know, there will always be, a, we can't, in general, just design an observer which will always just take this error straight to zero and stay at zero, like we could for the control problem yesterday. We could do it for the control problem yesterday because we had the full state. Here we only have the output. What um, Slotin's work seems uh, this, this uh, you know, tried to do was to make sure these areas were minimized. So we tried to make it so that the maximal set of initial conditions that were possible 
got to the sliding mode as quickly as possible and stayed there. So he, and he defined what was called the notion of the sliding patch, which effectively, as it says there, defines the reason for which it's possible to exhibit sliding behavior is maximized. So he tried to make it that that initial transient piece, the, the, the initial conditions we could have for which it's not possible to go straight to um, uh, 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 zero, that that was mi uh, minimized. Um, In a classical sense, and because he was dealing with nonlinear systems, Slotin very much was rather as we were yesterday for the control problem, was using the discontinuous injection for robustness. So very much for um, unmodeled dynamics, um, uh, parameter uncertainty within his companion form representation. And he sort of rather than... Um, Utkin, having talked about those two independent gains, he tended to, to talk more in terms of having a Leuenberger gain uh, observer raptor around the system. He was one of the first people to um, show that actually having a, a big discontinuous injection could give you some problems with measurement noise. And in what we do tomorrow, actually, with the differentiators, we will begin to look explicitly as, uh, at the impact of noise. I mean, I think you can see in, in potentially what the problem is. We've got something that drives Y and Y hat, the error between the two of them, to zero. If Y is incredibly noisy... The sliding mode observer, because it's so good at driving that error to zero, will try and track the noise. So the estimate y hat will, can become very, very contaminated by the noise. Um, and so that is something that we have to think about. The next important step came about in the 1980s when Walcott and Zach defined a new paradigm, a disruptive paradigm. And it was um, very much the step that let people take away the observability assumption. They had a problem, really, because they were ahead of their time. Fundamentally, they had ideas which were very sound. But at the time they were developing those ideas, the um, toolboxes like MATLAB, symbolic computation, was not, were not really very robust. And, and even today, I don't know whether any of you use some of those symbolic computation toolboxes, but it's possible I've been doing some work with a collaborator that's been doing some of that. And, and it is quite difficult for things where you know there is a solution to actually instruct some of those toolboxes to, in the right way to give you the solution. And if you don't know the solution, um, uh, then it becomes even more difficult. So the problem Walcott and Zach had was they had a brilliant idea that moved the paradigm. And it changed work in sliding mode observers. But their paradigm... Um, had difficulties because it required symbolic computation. And at the time, symbolic computation just couldn't cope with the problems they were trying to do. One of the steps that my team and I took when we were at Leicester was to replace that symbolic computation step with a numerical step, which is what we'll do this afternoon, which is much more straightforward to do. But it was great stuff, it included uncertainty, um, it, in terms of their, their statement, it, you, it showed there was huge promise for nonlinear systems, they could look at more general nonlinear systems, 
than Jean-Jacques Slotin had looked at with his canonical form. Um, and it was these ideas really which gave us the framework to sliding mode observer design, which I think is still universally um, applied. So let's explain what they did, because I think to get this picture helps us to understand what we um, then uh, need to do when we get to the transformations. If we just go into the transformations, it, it can be... You know, it can be easy to lose the step of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, whereas this shows nicely why we're doing what we're doing. So they considered a nominal linear system with some sort of unknown nonlinear function bounded but representing uncertainty. So they had what... Um, Utkin had, but they explicitly <laughs> included the nonlinearity. They initially included what we call matched uncertainty. So they defined it as being uncertainty which was implicit in the control input channels. So that is what they defined as the important channel for them. So that is, um, was what they defined and they define some bound um, on that uncertainty. As we said yesterday, without a bound, it's very difficult to make progress. So what they wanted to do was to estimate the states of this system um, so that the error system here is quadratically stable despite the presence of the S. So they were wanting to make sure that they could reject the presence of the F. And if we just think intuitively where the F acts, it acts in the input channel in this, in this particular formulation. It doesn't always have to act in the input channel. So for an observer formulation, it can act wherever we like. But this case, it acts in the input channel. And we've got to remember that we are taking measurements based on the output. Okay, so we've got uncertainty in the input channel and we're taking measurements in the output. The output in general is not the full state and so that means potentially there might be a mismatch of the channels where we can actually access the di directly the system with our discontinuity, which will be implicit in Y. And where the uncertainty is acting, which is implicit in the channels of the B matrix. So that is something we have to uh, bear in mind. In order to deal with that, uh, this, this channeling, Walcott and Zach formulated the observer problem as what's called a constrained Lyapunov problem. You might have heard of the constrained Lyapunov problem. How, how many people have heard of the constrained Lyapunov problem? Has anyone heard? It happens in other domains. The reason I ask is even if you haven't heard of sliding mode control, the constrained Lyapunov problem occurs in other domains of control. So other people use this constrained Lyapunov problem um, in, in other disciplines. So sometimes people have heard of it who haven't been involved in sliding mode control. But effectively, the constrained Lyapunov problem is seeking to find a Lyapunov pair, so a P and Q, which satisfies the Lyapunov equation. Remember, for the Lyapunov equation, we say if we um, can choose a symmetric positive definite Q, if A naught here is stable, then there will be a solution P to that Lyapunov equation, which is symmetric positive definite. So that's what Lyapunov, the Lyapunov equation says. But the constraint in the Lyapunov equation is this one here. So the classes of P that we can use 
to solve our Lyapunov equation must satisfy this um, constraint here where B is the channel where the uncertainty acts, C is where the output is coming, F is going to be something we use to modulate our discontinuous injection, and P must also solve, be a solution to the Lyapunov equation. And you can see what this is doing is providing a, an answer to that problem of the channeling, of the fact that we can measure the output, but the uncertainty is acting in the input matrix. And so here we can see that we are channeling here so that the output here is going to be able to access what's going on in the channels implicit in the B matrix, which is where the uncertainty acts. And it'll, be, it'll become obvious when we look at the structure of the observer um, why, this, why, this is, why this all drops out. So for the ABC in the, the Walcott and Zach formulation, they said it must um, satisfy a Lyapunov equation that and the P we get must be constrained here for some F. Okay? And the big problem they had was to solve that problem in general, symbolically, at the time, was very difficult. They were hypothesizing using symbolic tools, which was very difficult for real problems. So you could do it for, by hand for very small problems, but to do it in anger for big problems was was difficult, not just for people in the sliding mode community, but people across the control community. So based on being able to pick that F and that P, they hypothesized an observer, which was a, a copy of the nominal system. We clearly can't have the F there because we don't know what it is. A copy of the nominal system. There is the gain matrix G, that's used to stabilize within the Lyapunov equation. So we use that matrix here. If we just go back one, we see that A naught is A minus GC, um, where G is a stable matrix, and that's what we use um, within our Lyapunov equation. So we use that same G here, linear gain matrix. And then we channel in a discontinuous injection here that's channeled through that F. And the reason we do that simplistically is so we can get at the little f. So we can get at the uncertainty. It has to be channeled through the F here where we are using the parameters of that constrained Lyapunov equation, P, F within the observer, and F within the injection signal. We have a row here which is, is made big enough to counteract the size of the uncertainty. Remember we said little f was uh, bounded. This means this injection is big enough to force a sliding motion. This channels the injection so it can counteract the f. And we see that if we form the error system. So if we begin to form the error system here, we can look at quadratic stability. So we look at the P within that Lyapunov equation as defining a candidate Lyapunov function. And we know that if we can find, uh, determine V dot and find that V dot um, is everywhere um, negative, we are uh, okay. So if we substitute um, in for the E dot dynamics, the E dot dynamics um, come in through here, um, we get something looking like this. Note that we need the structural constraint here. This here represents the uncertainty. Okay, so here's the uncertainty coming in through PB, which comes in that way because 
of how the calculations work out when I put E dot in here. And we can see that this is where my discontinuity is coming in. There's not a match between those channels. But if we employ that structural constraint in here, we can see that it enables us to get something that multiplies a difference between the magnitude of the switch in my observer and the size of the uncertainty. So, so long as I make this sufficiently big, then this will be positive, this term will be negative, and my, um, the derivative of my Lyapunov function will be negative. Okay? So this is why I need the structural constraint mathematically. Why I need it physically is I'm channel matching. I'm making sure I can get that observer injection into where the uncertainty is acting. And that's clearly important for robustness of sliding mode observers. We need to be aware of the channels where the uncertainty is acting, um, or indeed where a signal we're trying to reconstruct is acting. And we'll see important examples of particular problems where we, where we map those channels as we get further on into the course where we can actually do some of this. So what we have from that is a domain in which we get a sliding mode on the output error here, F times the output error. We need the F because of this channeling. Okay. And it's a powerful result. I mean, the, the, the problem with it at the time, as I've hinted, is we need to find a G such that for an A naught, there's a P that satisfies the Lyapunov equation and satisfies this structural constraint for some f. And certainly at the time this result came out, um, software, symbolic algebra tools were not up to this, um, were not up to this job uh, at all. Um, uh, it was suggested, and you know, if they worked well, it, it would have worked. So the step that we took um, um, at the university, I was at the University of Leicester at the time, was to say, well, this is a really good idea. You know, if we can do this in a constructive way, so in a way where we can actually solve that problem, we can design observers that will be really powerful. But is there a way we can do it? Is there a way we can make a result where the the tools we have available will, will work. So the problem we considered very similar. We didn't actually call it B. And, and, and you know, um, I've used B because that's, that's what Walcott and Zach did. Um, and so for historical accuracy, I want to emphasize to you that for an observer problem, there's nothing to say that the input channels are important. You know, we can look at a problem and it will have uncertainty where, 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 it, where it happens. And that isn't a problem for us. So we need to be able to look at broad ranges. So here I've called it D and I've said that we will have you know, some uncertainty vector Q here, which just like Walcott and Zach will be unknown, but bounded. Everything will be full rank. So it may seem irritating that I've changed the notation, but the old notation of having the B here was what they actually did. In reality, if I put B there, it makes you think we can only do it. There needs to be B there, and B need, means something very specific to you. And I want to emphasize that it doesn't have to be B. It can be some uh, other ch channel. And rather like we had yesterday, we um, hypothesized being able to have a copy of the plant so clearly, again, we have the nominal parts, A, B, and C, at the heart of our observer. 
We had a linear gain, just as Walcott and Zach did, and indeed Slatine before them, and, an inje and a discontinuous injection signal that was modulated by some form of gain. And we wanted to um, make um, the system exhibit a sliding mode on the output error. So we wanted CE to be zero, and we wanted to think, you know, the problem we set ourselves was, well, is there a way of determining a GL and a GN that does everything that Walcott, Walcott and Zach want, which is clearly necessary to solve the problem, but can we do it numerically? So using matrices, information about A, B, C, and D, nothing to do with symbolic tools which are, weren't up to the job then. And, uh, you know, from my recent experience, I'm not sure that I'd want to do it for, for really significant problems um, now. They're better, but um, they're certainly not perfect. The first thing to notice about this formulation is we don't need observability. So I haven't said anything about observability for this and we don't need observability. So there is nothing to say the system needs to be observable. We have an existence condition, and then as we, I'm going to state it here, so this is, this is a, uh, the we will see why this condition uh, holds. It's quite important. It's important that we know what it is. It's not important to think, well, if, it's, if I start and a system doesn't satisfy this condition, I can't design a sliding mode observer. And in the industrial examples I've considered within this program, I've deliberately used one which doesn't satisfy part of this condition. And I'll show you that we were able to get a very good, practically feasible solution for a system where if you just do the classical modeling bit, get the ABCD, pop it into the codes and find it doesn't satisfy this, um, that that wasn't the place to stop and say we can't solve this problem, okay? So, um, there are two conditions. The first is that rank CD must equal Q. D, remember, is the distribution matrix of the uncertainty, and Q is the size of the um, um, uncertainty vector. Why do we need that? Well, we need that because if we're going to um, generate a, a, a sliding mode, we need to be able to solve out for an equivalent injection, theoretically, just like we did yesterday, to reconstruct the disturbance. Remember when we did that, we solved out, and so I said to you, the equivalent control is not something we use in practice. It's a theoretical concept. It's what is required to be able to get a relationship between um, the, what the discontinuous injection is doing on average and the uncertainty. So it's, it's linking the injection to the uncertainty. It's needed just the same. So if that equivalent injection is going to, be, is going to exist, I fundamentally need to be able to invert CD. I can't invert CD if it's not full rank. So that's what that has. The second condition says that any invariant zeros of ADC must lie in C minus. And we talked yesterday, somebody was asking a nice question about poles and zeros and classical things and how they played in. This is a very good example. The invariant zeros, if you think of what they are in a classical system, we can't access them by the input-output formulation. So we can't change them. They're invariant to the signals. Now, clearly, if we have invariant zeros in here, we can't access them because we've only got the output. Okay? If, the, if any parts of the system that we can't access are unstable, then they will appear on our error dynamics. And we will see intuitively when we look at the canonical form why this is the case. So it will be, it become obvious to you 
um, why this is the case. But if we have invariant zeros in the system, which we find using the T0 command in MATLAB, then that T0 command, um, um, if it produces things that are unstable, they will appear on the sliding mode dynamics, um, the aerodynamics. And so uh, the aerodynamics will be unstable. It's important to note that this condition simplifies if we've got a square system. So if the number of outputs and the number of uncertainty channels are the same, so the system is square here, um, same as having the, the same number of inputs and outputs, but, in, but now because we're, we're not dealing with inputs, we're dealing with the uncertainty channels, it's the uncertainty channels being the, uh, having the same dimension, um, as uh, the, <coughs> the, the number of output signals. In this particular case, it's the same as having a triple, which is relative degree one and minimum phase, which we often talk about in, in, in control. So many control results might say we need relative degree one minimum phase system. Remember, this isn't the actual system. This isn't B. This is D. Um, I can't emphasize enough that the uncertainty and where it acts is important. And you'll see in all the examples that I present to you later on today, those, how we do that is much, is where my emphasis is. Um, and I think many of the best results we've got, the, the results have been most useful, it's not been by having a handle turning approach to the design. It's by being thinking about the dynamics and thinking about this, how the uncertainty impacts on the system. Looking at where that uncertainty is, what we can measure, and how we can design the best observer that lets us access the things that we can't uh, measure. Right. So... I'm not going to worry about the changes of coordinates. We'll do that after the tea break in MATLAB because that's quite explicit. Um, <coughs> I'm going to, to, to say what the canonical form is and then we'll look at it numerically this afternoon, well, well af after the tea break. But fundamentally, we can show that there is a change of coordinates that puts that system, that linear system, in a very good form for observer design, just as we saw for controller design. The upper subsystem here is going to be the bit where the outputs don't act. Okay, the bits where the outputs don't act. This here is the channel where the outputs do act. So if you see this this one here, n minus p by n minus p. This one here, p by p. Okay? So this is where the outputs act. This is where the, um, we have the, the outputs don't act. Why have I got this stacking here? Well, I've got this stacking here because I've got p outputs and I have got Q, um, <coughs> I've got Q um, uncertain signals. Okay, so, so they're not necessarily the same. If it's square, I don't need this here. But if it's not square, then I, I, I need to split, split this up. So um, we also have to notice that for this bit up here, I have to split it into two parts where the invariant zeros will appear here. So these are the bits I can't access. So if these are transmission zeros, then I cannot access those by uh, manipulating the signals I have available to me. So I have to pull that off. So we talk about having R invariant zeros. The rest is observable so I can do something with it. So anything here, which is a transmission zero, I pull off. 
If it's stable, it's fine. And clearly, if I meet my conditions, I've said that the transmission zeros must be in the left half plane, we're okay. So that will just have some stable poles determined by the system. If they're unstable, it doesn't meet the condition, the existence condition I have, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do it. The reason we wouldn't be able to do it is we'd have a positive pole here corresponding to the transmission zero, which we couldn't access at all. Okay? We have the forcing functions being distributed between the D bar. So this D2 here, remember, is Q by Q. Because we're not assuming that we have P uh, uncertain uh, channels. Okay? So rather like yesterday, we're pushing all that down to the bottom where we have the outputs, but the number of output channels can be different. And then we typically have the distribution matrix in this kind of form. So we, uh, at this stage, don't necessarily make this the identity matrix. We've got a lot more to deal with in terms of this mismatch in terms of the dimensions than we had yesterday for the control problem. So we just say that this is an orthogonal matrix. Um, there are, th this slide here just really explains what I said, that we've got this problem with the fact that we've got P outputs and we've got Q uncertainty channels in general. And so we've got to check all the matrices balance up. So that's why we have this pair stat um, here. You can do the algebra to show. I haven't put the algebra on the slides. It's, it's not difficult to do at all, but it just, you know, is um, matrix manipulations. So, given those necessary and sufficient conditions that I provided, together with this canonical form, we've got a means to do design because the A110 is stable. Um, we can stabilize that upper subsystem because part of it is stable anyway because of the transmission zeros and the rest we can stabilize by choice of an appropriate L. If we then define a further transformation that depends on that L, okay, again, being very careful about our, um, our uh, dimensions, um, Effectively, today, remember for the control problem, we did it with the M here. Okay? So, in a sense, this is like the existence problem. This is making sure the error dynamics are stable. This here is going to help us be able to determine the injection. So, once we change um, corresponding to that L, we can then pull down our system to have the um, final P states, which are the outputs, which makes it easy. All this does is say, well, we have to do some algebra to work out the impact of these transformations on these sub-blocks within the system, bearing in mind we've got different layers with, with the N, the P, and the Q in, in, in the system. Why do we do that? Well, we do it fundamentally because, and you know, all of those, the, the, the fancy bits of, um, uh, you know, saying that we have to map the, the, the size of the matrices, which is obvious. Why have we done it? Well, we've done it because we then end up with something that's nicely in this form. So I'm using script A and script B and script D here. This is the output. So clearly when I look at doing an observer based on this, I can pull off the output error. I here have all the uncertainty acting in channels implicit in the output. So I can counteract it by injecting based on the output error. And I have a matrix here which is stable. It's Stable because the transmission zeros are stable, and it is also stable because of that L I picked to stabilize that other sub bit. So I 
do exactly what I did before in terms of define an observer. I make a copy of the plant apart from the bit I don't know, the uncertainty. So I make a copy of the plant here. I then have a discontinuous injection here, which enters my Y subsystem. I have two pieces of linear gain. And what this piece does is it's going to get rid of this part of the aerodynamics. This piece is going to get rid of this piece of the aerodynamics. This, just like yesterday, and, and in terms of the extension to the Lewenberg uh, of the Utkin observer design, gives me some asymptotic stabilization of the EY subsystem. And we see that um, when we write down the aerodynamics. My observer looks like this. P2 is going to be a positive definite. Um, solution based on A22S, which I choose for that asymptotic decay, and that gives my nonlinear injection. And I have a gain which is big enough to counteract the uncertainty. And with all this, I have an aerodynamics that drops out nicely, like 46 and 47. And this is very clean. Remember, A11 is stable. So this script A11 is stable. The transmission zeros, the L have stabilized. This, this makes this aerodynamic here stable. EY dot, by choice here of new, I can make these two things have opposite signs. This is depending on EY. This is depending on EY dot. The uncertainty is coming in here. If I make this big enough to counteract the uncertainty, then EY will go to zero. E1 is going to zero here. The way we do the proof, let me just check the time. I've got plenty of time. The way we do the proof, we can see that effectively we've got two subsystems, one which is stable here anyway, one which we know we're going to be able to stabilize from what we've already learned about sliding modes. But we do the proof by effectively considering the two subsystems, and we define two Lyapunov equations, one for each subsystem. We define Q1 and Q2 as sy symmetric positive definite design matrix. Q Q1 has di square dimension n minus p, and it corresponds to um, the uh, bits where there are no outputs. This Q2 corresponds to the outputs. Um, we define P2 as being the solution to the Lyapunov equation with the Q2, which is P by P, um, where I've selected my A22S. That's the thing that's giving me the asymptotically stabilizing part. And then I let P1 be the solution to this Lyapunov equation. Now, note I haven't got just got Q1 there. And the reason I haven't got just got Q1 there is because this isn't a diagonal system. I have to be able to deal with the off-diagonal terms. And I can quite nicely deal with the off-diagonal terms because this here is also um, symmetric positive definite. So having defined the P1 and the P2, I can write down a Lyapunov function, rather like um, I did for the Walcott and Zach case, um, uh, which is a function of the two individual systems. And I can show, um, doing exactly the same as I did before, that if I take the derivative V dot of each of these, feed in the relevant E1 dot and EY dot dynamics, simplify from the Lyapunov equations, then it drops out. The error system is quadratically stable. I can also consider just the EY subsystem, the output error, because that's the thing I'm going to try and slide on. And I can show that an ideal sliding motion takes place on 35, which is just the equation um, 
EY equals zero. So we put it all together and we have an observer. We have to back transform with the transformations, but based on our original system, we can determine a GL and a GN depending on various of the transformations we picked. Um, P2 from that second Lyapunov equation, and it's all numeric. So the first thing, there was nothing in there that said I had to use symbolic tools like Walcott and Zach did. We're using a constrained Lyapunov formulation. In fact, we published, at the time we did this work, we realized that it was applicable more widely than just to sliding mode observers. We realized it was a numerical solution to the, to the constrained Lyapunov problem. Um, and that was published in Automatica. And lots of people have used that solution, nothing to do with sliding mode observers or sliding mode controllers. So if you ever find yourself in some other domain and you need to solve a constrained Lyapunov problem, you know a solution that's nice and numeric and a way to do it in MATLAB that by lunchtime we'll all be able to do. It's important to note that we didn't say anything about it being observable and doesn't require nothing to do with A, D, C being observable at all. Just the rank condition on um, the um, C and D matrices and the requirement that these transmission zeros are stable. And that's enough to just use this as a handle turning algorithm. As I say, that that condition is not, it's not the case that that condition means you can't do something else. And we'll spend some time looking at what else you do. I've done a little example here, just to go back to the example we used yesterday. I've used the pendulum system where we have the A and the B. Bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Um, but if we go through the motions here with the output distribution matrix being C, we change coordinates to make um, uh, <coughs> the system, the output equation to be the final uh, state. We don't have any problems with the matching of the matrices because this is square. Um, the uncertainty channels and the, the dimension of the output is exactly the same. A11 tilde is minus 1, so we know it's stable. And it is, in fact, a transmission zero. So in this system, the fact that it's a transmission zero is important. If this was unstable here, we couldn't move it. Um, we define the A22S as minus one. So we get uh, a stable A0 with two poles at minus one. We can define the Q2, sol uh, solve that corresponding Lyapunov equation. And that means I've got everything, the gain matrices, I can write down the observer, and you can see that it tracks very nicely. So again, choosing a pendulum because it's oscillating. No friction, of course, in the model we had yesterday, so it doesn't stop oscillating. But we can see that it converges very, very, uh, very, very nicely. If we look at the, the states, we can see that we get very good replication um, and if we because a lot of people say well you know what why, why bother with all this um, what happens if we just use a Lewenberger observer well we can see that the nonlinear sign term distorts the output so the output doesn't go to zero the output error can only go to zero because we're applying a discontinuous injection signal to show you that this principle of the equivalent injection, I don't call it equivalent control because it's not a control problem, the equivalent injection signal, um, we can look at what the discontinuous con uh, injection signal was doing in the, in the simulations. We can see that it is switching hugely. If we try and do this um, here, uh, as a smoothed version, it's quite difficult to smooth this. You can see I haven't smoothed it perfectly. But we can see that a filtered signal 
is showing quite nicely. The sine term in there is in there, and this discontinuous bit here is, is a filtered version of this heavy signal here, which is typical of the heavy signal we'd apply in an observer problem. Why compromise on the theory? Why not use a big gain for robustness? Why not make it discontinuous? Because we can. Okay? Um, we can see here that that um, construction property holds. And we're going to use this later on this afternoon to, um, with some practical problems to look at developing monitoring systems to be able to reconstruct signals.